I am so delighted that you have come to join us this evening or at another time should this uh, webinar still air on the Beautiful Minds website. Um, you know, when you're looking for ways to interact with the mix of both traditions and this world of pain that we're in, it takes a really courageous person um, to make this step tonight and to say, I'm going to join in here. I, have, I am looking for something that is going to help me. And that's exactly why we've invited you to grab a paper and a pen or pencil so that you can jot down what that one or two or three things are that you will get from this time that we'll spend together that's just right for you. So you can only imagine that with a myriad of losses um, that we have all been exposed to um, this past year, that there's a wide array of being able to apply the principles of healthy response and healthy resilience to those losses. So although I might be presenting something or talking about something that is in the, in the venue of maybe um, a, a person that has died, just extrapolate that for something else that you have lost. So we'll, I think we'll, we'll do a good job at that. But just keep that paper and pencil handy because I, I so want to encourage you to make a list of things um, that you want to keep with you and take with you following this seminar. Now, the poll results have been really helpful. And I want to assure you that um, whatever you were seeking for, um, I think you're going to find um, adequate um, information and something that will truly help either bring you hope or give you ideas and um, support you, encourage you, help you understand how we grieve during the holiday. So I wanted to let you know that I too have lived through a holiday with a broken heart. In fact, several holidays with a broken heart. After our three and a half year old son died of leukemia, holidays just were like the thing I dreaded the most. Who wanted to go there and do that? There was just no joy in any of that anymore. And then I've lived through holidays with estranged relationships or with family members struggling with mental illness. Um, we've lived through holidays anticipating um, elderly parents' um, death um, as they were on hospice. But none of us have faced any of these or many of them plus a global pandemic on top of it. So we're really in this uncharted territory of how to navigate this. Um, but I really believe that we can keep loving and we can live fearless as we encounter these changes that seem to be completely out of our control. So maybe a couple of the things tonight will just give you that little connection to live with love and reduce the fear that you're experiencing right now. Um, I know that for many of us, there will be empty chairs at the table. And for some, all their chairs will be empty. And it might be due to the cause of a fire that burned down their house. And there is no home and no table and no chairs to enjoy. I mean, think of all the ravishing fires we've had throughout the West Coast this year. Um, and then there is the pandemic that is pushing its way into our normal way of acting, behaving, and celebrating. Um, I know that there are... COVID widows who are spending this Thanksgiving alone. And that just breaks my heart. Um, so whether it is through fire or flood or COVID or the death of someone important and special to you that has sat at your table, you have come to the right place to figure out how to navigate and manage this holiday season. So I want to be really broad spectrum here. What does the empty chair represent for you? You know, it could mean a variety of things. Um, like we've mentioned, the absence of a loved one or maybe the absence of many loved ones. Um, it might be the loss or the changes that the COVID world has created in your heart 
your heart that now has tension or stress or anxiety or fear, or sorrow, overwhelm. And it just makes it feel like there's no even desire to um, fill a table or engage in those regular and normal activities that we would have for Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's. So would you take a moment and share in the chat box with us, um, respond, what is the empty chair for you tonight when you're thinking about what your options are? What does the empty chair represent for you? Um, please, Give us a little bit of feedback so we can understand what it's like for you um, before we really move forward in the rest of our seminar. I'll go over a few options. I know Kathy mentioned um, that the empty chair for her is um, what COVID has done to her business, to lose her business. So we've got a loss of a brother-in-law. And um, I'm going to let Michelle read those through because I just want to stay here and keep attention with, with you. And so she's going to share those in just a minute. But, you know, there have been such racial and political tensions that that separated families. Um, there's been death or divorce or estrangement, um, mental illness, fire, flood, job loss. What are some of the things that are causing our being represented by your empty chair tonight? Michelle, you want to give us a list okay. of what you're seeing? Yeah. Thank you. So I am um, seeing, well, as you mentioned, um, the fires. We have Tammy, who's lost her home, all her favorite recipes and traditions mm -hmm. because of the glass fire. Um, we have uh, the loss of a brother-in-law. Um, and... Um, Memories that can never be made again in this life. Um, somebody's mm. mourning that. A death of a loved one and changes that COVID world has created. Um, Christine has uh, lost her son in 2010. And her husband died just on October 5th mm. of this year. Mm. Um, some um, Joan is missing the opportunity to celebrate traditions with her grown children because they live out of state. Um, is, and so we're seeing not being able to be with relatives. Um, Lisa has a difficult family situation and so was not able to celebrate Christmas with her family this year. Um, Linda is feeling the loss of freedom, not being able to do the things that she's done in the past because of the pandemic. We have another death. Connie has lost her husband in June of this year. Um, Jerry had a loss of a relative this year. Um, Beth has feeling the loss in her own heart, loss of parents and the ability to share with children and grandchildren out of state, feeling the uncertainty about the future. Um, Lori's husband um, left the family suddenly after 38 years. Mm. Um, Suzanne is feeling, says for the first time, will be alone for the holidays since her, um, her daughter took her life. So that empty chair will be more obvious this year. Yeah. Um, Brenda has lost her husband uh, home after 36 years. Um, we have um, Donnelly, his husband, our dad just died. Um, Kathy also doesn't know what to do with her time. Um, COVID has taken away all the things that mm -hmm. she enjoys. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Oh. Yes, thank you each for sharing. Um, that took courage as well, is to identify um, what the empty chair represents to you. And um, you're just really in the right place to spend this time together with us. Let's take a look at how we can understand what's happened. Um, because on top of those personal losses and a human being that might not be at your table. So much other has changed that um, permits us from being able to gather in a normal grieving way, in a normal healthy grieving way. So it seems to me that all loss and grief and trauma 
our result of change, whether it's a sudden abrupt change or gradual change. Um, and that resiliency just allows us to adapt to change in positive ways. But some of us might not be even aware of what resilience means and how do I find that resilience to engage in what are yet ahead for the next month of what would be typical celebrations or atypical celebrations now that, I mean, just think there's no Christmas concerts. How, how does that work? Um, no public gatherings for celebrating those kinds of things. So this empty table, empty chair kind of just represents so much of what has changed for us. And some of this daily life change is the wearing of masks or school that is either in session or on, on Zoom, seminars, church attendance, shopping, doctor's appointments. We just took our pets to the vet yesterday and it's now now curbside service. What a difference it is. We sat in the car, they came in, they came out, took our pets into the vets. We don't know what they did with them in there. Then they brought them back and away we went. I mean, there's just so much change everywhere. And I don't know about you, but would you consider yourself someone who does change well? Or you don't do change well? Either way, you've probably figured out some ways of surviving. That the survival skill is still within you. Even when you don't do change well, you survive it. But would we prefer to find the path to thrive? And that's what I would hope for every one of us. So let's take a look. Would you look at this photo with me? When you see these um, lightly dusted snowy mountains and these beautiful fall leaves that are framing this scene, um, what potential changes can take place in a, in a scene in nature like this? Well, one of the changes that I can think of right off is that a um, warm wind would blow through for the next couple of days and melt all that dusting of snow away. Um, the gray sky that we see back there could be changed to a blue sky. Or um, a cold wind could come in and blow in a heavy storm. And now the mountaintops would not just be dusted with snow. We would see snow all the way down to the valley floor, possibly. And when that changes, then what orange leaves that are still on these trees would probably fall off with the wind and the cold um, taking place. And there would be a full on winter scene in front of us. So as we live through the seasons of loss and grief, it really becomes all about how do we adapt to change? And it, that's why it just made me stop and think as I was preparing this um, time to be together with you, I stopped and I thought, you know, maybe the four seasons are really a good place to start. Just as a vivid reminder that no one season lasts forever. It will change. And we can anticipate that it will change. And we each have things that we prefer about each of the seasons and things that we might not care for for each of the seasons. And so just the fact that the natural world around us is demonstrating that change is always happening, maybe we could take away from that, that with always happening change, could we find something good in the season we're in, as well as accept the things that are not so good? Um, could we be hopeful about change? Is it possible to even welcome some change? And could we begin to trust that we can thrive somewhere in and amongst this changing? So one of the ways that I have found that might help us make that first step to adjust to change is to actually permit the empty chair. Um, instead of whisking it away and resetting the table and pretending that there's been no loss, no pain, no change. That doesn't really work well for us. 
So maybe we just need permission to grieve the losses. Maybe we need permission to um, allow the sorrow and the sadness to exist. Um, so I would encourage you personally to invite grief to stay present. Now, what do I mean with that? Well, I certainly do not mean that we should be giving ourselves permission to be miserably on, oh, uh, disturbing, I suppose, to other people. So how do we allow grief to be present and not disturb other people with our grief? Well, let's look at what some, some ways to practice that might look like. If we are going to have give ourselves permission to grieve, what would that look like? Well, first of all, I think we need to recognize that grief is the price we pay for love. I think of Kathy, whose um, business has been so disrupted. I really would guess that Kathy absolutely enjoyed her work, found it very satisfying. She said she doesn't know what to do with this time. And so her grief is because she loved her work, um, in addition to the fact that she appreciated the income that it brought for her. Our grief can be because we loved someone and or we've loved traditions or we have loved our home that's no longer here with us. So the first top deal is to be honest. Um, then practice some intentionality. So grief is much more than sad, mad or despairing feelings. But if those are the feelings, let's admit them. Let's say I'm sad, I'm angry, and I'm feeling despairing. Because if we don't do that, we hide it by pretending or denying that grief is existing. I often liken it to um, when things get pushed back, way back, 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 back in the back of the refrigerator, you know, and we forget it's there until months later and we have this strange aroma that's coming out of the refrigerator and sometimes even something gooey that comes along with it and it's unattended to food food that's been left it un left unattended to turns stinky you know what when we don't attend to our grief it turns stinky too so i'm going to give you an example and an opportunity to attend to that grief through a couple of ways so we're going to talk about some self-care and we're going to talk about pie sop and how to make a plan. So I'm giving you permission for you to have freedom to feel what's real for you. And if it brings about tears, that's altogether even better for you because tears are a way of releasing the stress that builds up for us. So sometimes just a good hard cry is such a excellent way for us to process these real feelings that we have. Um, but there are other ways that we can exhibit self-care. And I want to talk about those. Let's just go back here for a minute. You know, the feeling might be just to roll up in a fetal position and just put the covers over our heads and not come out until this is all over. But I would love for you to feel a sense of control because when we really feel the feelings that are generated by loss and change and trauma, it helps us stay in control, stay in control better than if we stuff them. So it might feel like, feel like our emotions are taking control. But that's when we're free to acknowledge that they exist. And by just acknowledging it, we've opened up the refrigerator, we've let the stink out, we can deal with it, we can interact with it. And um, that's a better thing to do. So some of that self-care is to make sure that we have eaten well and taking good care of ourselves, um, that we have gotten good rest and plenty of water and hydration. I was just coaching with somebody a couple weeks ago 
who, when I asked her, I said, you know, how, what's your water intake like? Cause she was telling me how lethargic she was. She just had no energy. She couldn't do a thing. And so I said, do an experiment for five days, set out eight gla glasses of water and drink them all within that one day for five days. And then tell me about it when we get back on our next session. She said it drinking water was such a huge energy boost for her. It brought back some mental clarity and it really helped her find the way to be engaged with the world around her, even though she was grieving sadly about the death of her brother. But just drinking water helped her to be come move from non engagement into engagement. So those are a couple of self care things that we can do. Um, Let's move forward. So PISOP. PISOP is probably the best way to interact with our grief. PISOP is an acronym that stands for put your stuff on paper. PISOP, put your stuff on paper. I'm now telling my clients and anybody that um, is interested in becoming healthy with their losses, trauma, or grief, to stop journaling, stop writing, because writing and journaling has something to do with our academic life and learning how to write letters in school and write sentences and paragraphs and term papers and research papers as we progress through our academic worlds. But PISOP is not that at all. PISOP is honoring and reflecting what really is. So it's not about handwriting, spelling, punctuation, organization, grammar. It's not ever about somebody else reading it or seeing it. PISOP is simply putting your stuff on paper in a way that's random, messy, unorganized. It simply reflects what is inside of you, which is random, messy, and unorganized. And what's inside of me, random, messy, and unorganized. So here are our questions for a PISOP activity. Right now, we're gonna have four minutes. Michelle's gonna play a little music in the background. I'm gonna click off my camera and when it's time, the, the music will stop and um, we'll stop our PISOPing. So you may pick one of these jump lines or you might have something else that just says, I'm, I am PISOPing about this. But you could PISOP, how do you really feel? You could pice up, well, my plan for self-care is, or what I really miss is. So Michelle, are you ready with that music? And we'll begin when the music starts.
Welcome back, everybody. And um, if you are at all interested in just sharing what that PISOP activity felt like for you, I would very much welcome. I'm curious to know um, if this is the first time you've put stuff on paper, this is something you regularly do. Um, was it useful? Could it have been better in a different way or a different format? I have had n so many people that have been so benefited by just finding the space that they could be real on paper and could just freely let what they're feeling come out, what they're thinking, what they're questioning, what or what their plan is to come out. So um, I definitely, if, if you could put a little thought there and just tell me what that was like for you, that would be wonderful. Um, oh, thank you, Joan. I love that. Yes, it is much more freeing. Um, and it's honest and real. Thank you so much. Um, it's very different, um, Christine, than um, a regular journal entry. Um, it, it's a lot more honest. Um, for sure. Well, I want to share this next picture with you. It comes from a friend of mine whose husband died um, probably about a year and a half ago now. And so much of her widow activities took place in um, with a COVID experience. And she made intentional plans. And I just wanted to share this with you because um, as we anticipate upcoming um, traditional times of being together, we find that um, if we make a plan for it, it seems to go a little bit better. So one of the plans would be self-care plan. And we, we mentioned those just briefly, um, permitting your grief and continuing to pice up. Um, please continue to put your stuff on paper. Lisa says that she's feeling guilty about being sad and feeling helpless. So Lisa, then you might want to pice up about guilty because this is a natural, normal and healthy way of feeling is sad and helpless. Um, feeling helpless in helping my sin. Well, there's no sin in grieving, Lisa, not one a bit. So, um, and I'm really glad that Tracy enjoyed the freedom of not having to worry about the writing pro process. So Lisa, you might wanna stay in touch with Beautiful Minds and um, see how we can give you some extra support with that. So back to this picture. This is a picture of a place that was set in honor of her deceased husband. Um, she took photos throughout the year, and you're going to see a few more of them, and posted them on Facebook where she had social support, even though she was isolated and alone at home. Um, this widow set a place at the table to remember her husband in his honor. Um, you know, different plans come with different stages in our grief. It's not likely that this grieving widow will do this every year in the years to come on the anniversary of his death. But this was the appropriate one for her to do for his first anniversary of his death. You see, few of us hear this concept that there are actually three logical um, phases of grief. There is early grief and mid grief and late grief. And depending upon where we are in our intentional healing process, um, it will change the activities we choose to do. So many of the things that I'm going to be talking about today are the things that have to do with early grief. And they may or may not be what someone would do in mid grief or later grief. So I'll try to distinguish that, but this was definitely an early grief table setting with an empty chair for my friend. As she ate um, with just her daughter and her son-in-law at the table, they openly talked about who and what her husband and their father meant to, 
to all of them. And it was a very special memory making time for them. But you know, there's more to just making a plan and you know executing it. There is managing the empty chair at the table. Can we actually be transformed from the loss? Can we be transformed into something that's beautiful, someone that's beautiful? I would like to suggest that there is a healing that is deep and thorough that can transform the suffering and the pain of loss into something that's beautiful. And one of the things, one of the ways that that happens is in service projects for other people is to start to begin to think of, hmm, what other business owners are going through their loss and how could we support each other? Hmm, what other widows are going through their loss and how could we support each other? So we want to be proactive in this place of managing this empty place at the table, this empty chair. How do we want to manage it? How do we want to have actions that would honor the loss and trauma and grief in our life that would be healthy actions? Um, so preparing a plan and thinking of something ahead of time and executing it is one of the very best ways. Um, I have someone close to me whose um, son's wife died a year ago, Thanksgiving time. And he's prone to using alcohol to cover up his pain and had already begun moving in that direction, um, anticipating the anniversary of his death's wife, his wife's death. But this very wise mother suggested to her son, why don't you make a plan for how you want to honor your wife at Christmas time? What would you like to do? And about a week later, he returned to his mom and said, I know exactly what I'm going to do to honor my wife this Christmas. And it had to do with putting up a Christmas tree and putting up all of her favorite Christmas ornaments and decorations on the tree. For the time being, he is not drinking his sorrow away. He is now anticipating, preparing for his plan of how he's going to honor his wife. And so managing um, these memories, managing the forward movement of what will I do without my daughter and how will we face our holiday alone this time? Well, maybe another person could be blessed by a kindness that you could have towards them. Maybe sharing flowers um, with your local um, senior living community or convalescent home would be a way of extending kindness towards someone else. I know we would hope that someone would send us cards or gifts, but maybe there are people that we know that could use a gift card who are um, a survivor of fire, trauma, and loss. Um, Maybe we could write a note or a card to someone and say, I'm just thinking of you. Maybe we could share that encouragement on our social media places. Um, maybe we could Skype, FaceTime, or Zoom as part of our special day on Thanksgiving and make it something that we can look forward to. Maybe one of the table discussions with that empty chair would be what is the legacy we want to keep from this love with that came from this loved one that will go with us into the rest of our lives? And maybe each person, how small gathering it though it may be, has a different legacy from that person in the family that they want to keep. Maybe we could begin to look at a way of bringing healing for the regrets the woulda, coulda, shouldas, the if onlys. You know, it's winter time and many of us have wood burning stoves or a fireplace or even a fire pit outside. What would happen if we made a little ceremony where we actually wrote down on a piece of paper, I am sorry 
that I let this time pass and I didn't do, take these actions. I regret this. Or I woulda, coulda, shoulda, woulda changed that. And put it all down on the paper. And then when you're ready to let God forgive you for that, put it in the fire. And just watch something transform that was once a real um, tangible regret in your life turn into ashes. You know, that's how forgiven we all are. So these are just a few ways that we could um, be intentional and be proactive and actually make a plan. In this picture, that same friend of mine on another occasion for one of the first of that she was processing with her husband's death was to create this table of the some of his favorite things and places he'd been and ways that he had interacted in the world around him and just set it up there as a memorial for, for the day. This was her husband and how much she enjoyed gathering those things and remembering him. I know that some people light a candle in someone's honor and maybe the candles at your dining room table could be in their honor. You see, if we just give ourselves permission to manage the empty chair, to plan something, to be proactive with it, it can change the outcome of and actually moving away from dreading this time together or dreading this day into some way that we would anticipate it because we've made it a time to honor the loss the grief, and the persons that are not with us this time. So let's take a quick look at the last of the three things that we wanted to talk about tonight. Practicing being present at the table. Now, that's another concept that sometimes when we are so lost in our grief, we bring our grief with us to the table and we bring all the past with us in the table and we bring all the unknown future with us in the table and maybe just maybe it's okay not to grieve the same friend of mine who sat many a table this last year for herself um, sat this beautiful breakfast table because she was trying to transition into living in the present and this is what she posted on Facebook when she sent this picture. This is what she says. For the first time in 16 years, I ate breakfast in my courtyard. Such a beautiful experience. Enjoying the breeze, the fragrance of my first roses of the season, the singing birds, and the haunting sound of a distant train. Now, she gave herself permission not to grieve, instead to be aware and to notice the things that were beautiful around her in her life at that moment. So if we can leave the past for a time of reflection or pie sopping, if we can attend to futuring in a pie sop adventure or at another time for daydreaming or making plans, and just permit ourselves to be present right now, this day, with whom we might have and where we might be, I, it might be the very best thing we can do. And as we do that, we could collect gratitude, just like my friend did, who stopped and listened and goes, oh, there's birds out today. Oh, I can hear a train. I can smell these roses. I can smell these flowers. Because you see, gratitude, the practice of gratitude, is one of the quickest ways to shift from being a victim of our circumstances to being in control. And I would so welcome you into that place of that transition. You see, we can overtake resentments with gratitude and forgiveness. We can overtake self-pity with gratitude. We can actually learn to give thanksgiving 365. It is a proven component of wellness 
There are massive amounts of research and articles on the internet that will substantiate this amazing, small, simple, totally free therapeutic activity of just collecting a little bouquet of gratitude. Now, Thanksgiving, that's what it's all about. And I have posted a couple of articles about co-mingling, a co couple of blogs on my website, and I'll give you that information at the end, of co-mingling Thanksgiving with grieving and how that can be done. But tonight, in spite of COVID, or maybe even because of COVID, what are you thankful for? Let me give a quick example. I was working with a coaching client um, at the early part of COVID. And she said, I am so thankful for COVID because it's helped me stop and assess the need I have to make things right with my family. So maybe in spite of or because of COVID, you have some gratitude. Maybe even through the loss, there are beautiful evidences of comfort and strength that others have brought to you. So would you just take a moment and on that PISOP paper, write three things, just boom, boom, boom. What would be three things you're thankful for? Maybe it's for beautiful minds and the work that they're doing to help support people during this time. Maybe it's just for this gorgeous picture of these leaves and um, the cool, crisp air of fall. Um, where we live, the leaves outside are just amazingly beautiful. Three quick things that you are thankful for. And last of all, about being present with yourself is to be there. Don't just send your body on ahead, but be there for yourself. Uh, you can take your gratitude and blessings to the table. Um, if you truly are going to be by yourself, Take a good book or arrange for a video call during your meal. But we can always choose the attitude we want to dine with. This same friend that you've been seeing table settings had Easter by herself this year. But she didn't create it a pity party. She created something beautiful and something that she would relate to. Now, maybe you would relate to sitting with a bag, uh, you know, a table on a tray of food and watching the ball game on, on Thanksgiving Day or Christmas Day. Um, but be there with yourself, with gratitude and with a positive attitude. So the very last thing that we might want to consider for that empty chair at the table, if you are someone who knows God, has been acquainted with Jesus. We know that the Christmas season is here all about Jesus' arrival to this planet. And when he arrived, he did not come into a perfect world. He came into this pain-filled world for us to be God with us. That's what e Emmanuel means, God with us. So maybe you would like to envision that empty chair filled with the presence of Jesus. It could be just the comfort and the hope and the assurance that you will never be alone, ever. Emmanuel, God with us. You know, Michelle is going to pop in here for just a minute. She's got a couple of things to share, and then I'm going to wrap things up for our evening together. Come on back, Michelle. Oh, by the way, I'm loving reading your gratitudes. Thank you for sharing them. Yes, thank you. It's um, been nice to read about, about those and that we can find something to be grateful for even in hard times. So thank you, Karen, for what you have been sharing. And I hope that, um, that this has been helpful for you, that you can think ahead of how you can plan for this holiday season and how you can prepare for it. And, and how that will be a blessing to you and, and to your other loved ones that you are spending the holidays with if you are able to get together. So, um, I, and again, thank you, Karen, for sharing this information. Um, we just wanna give you a, a chance again, if you are blessed by the information that, that we're sharing and if these types of webinars are helpful, 
that um, that you can support Beautiful Minds. We would love to continue throughout this next year now, sharing more um, webinars and workshops and um, and even some online courses that we have to to help people. So I'm just going to just really quickly um, give you an opportunity again on the donation box um, if you would like to um, to share with Beautiful Minds. We would appreciate that. Um, Karen, is this when you want me to share about our special promotion? Um, okay. No, just <laughs> what what? Okay, yeah, yeah, just about the, the donation. We were going to do the promotion yes. just after we do the okay. takeaways. Thank you. I could remember. So uh, yes, we're just going to give you a second here if you would like to support Beautiful Minds um, and help us to continue with these services. All right. Okay. Good. I'll just get back to the last couple slides here. And, um, you know, Thanksgiving, um, a grieving um, person wrote this a few years back, and it might not be as applicable when we can't have those touch that we're so used to. But would you watch what I'm going to do with my arms? I just put my hands around my shoulders and gave myself a really nice hug. Now, this is a survival thing for COVID, and I just want to <laughs> toss it out there for you. If you've never hugged yourself, you now have permission and a purpose to do so because we need that kind of sensation. So one person wrote, Thanksgiving, this season I'm thankful for hands that hold mine, hearts that hurt with me, ears that listen, arms ready to hug, even if they're your own arms, friends who support, and family who remember. So as we wrap up our time together, what would you say is a takeaway for you? Um, I, you can write that again in your notes. You know, what are you taking away from this time we spent together? Um, just one or two ideas. And again, it would help me tremendously if you pop those in the chat box while um, I just share our last slide. You know, Comfort for the Day is the name of our grief care and education resources. Uh, we have a website, comfortfortheday.com, where I blog for people who have hurting hearts. And um, so you are welcome to visit Comfort for the Day and read some of those blogs, stay in touch with us, um, and take a look at some of the other things that are available for you. In fact, Michelle's going to be talking about one of them that is on our website and the Beautiful Minds website as well. Um, as well as our Comfort for the Day Facebook page, where you can just access, um, because if you like and follow it, um, little short pieces that we put out on, on Facebook, just to keep people encouraged, both to comfort others as well as to be comforted yourself. So those are our resources we want you to be able to go away with. Oh, I'm so glad. Paisop and Four Seasons, Thanksgiving with your Heavenly Father. Plan something ahead to look forward to. Nice. You guys have got some great takeaways. But we've got one very special takeaway for you, and that's from Michelle. So, Michelle, you want to join us back here and tell us what you've got ready. Hey. Thank you, Karen. Um, I told you that at the end, I wanted to share a special course uh, that Beautiful Minds has partnered with Comfort for the Day to create. And this is something that came out just a little bit earlier this year. And so I just wanted to take just a quick minute to share it with you this evening. Um, so Karen has um, helped us to create a course called The Principles of Healthy Grief. And in this course, Karen goes through six fundamental principles of grief. And the course is interactive. There's video instruction. There are some interactive downloads and some proactive applications that you can take um, from this course. It's self-paced. And once you purchase it, you actually have lifetime access to it. So you can go over it uh, again and again as you need to. So I wanted to just take a two minutes here and show you just a very short clip from the very beginning of this this online course. It's um, the very first video, and I'm just going to show you the, the beginning of it. So if you hang on just one second, um, we'll share that. Healthy grief principle number one. 
grief is necessary. Wow. Most of us would rather do anything else than grieve, right? But it is necessary, and we're going to discover in the next few minutes what makes it necessary and why is it necessary so that we can move away from running away from our grief and stepping into it um, on purpose and with intention. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about my friend Pam. Um, her husband died very tragically in um, an accident outside of the country. And there was no control she had over that death, over that loss, over the absence of her husband, none at all. But what she could control was how she responded to that. And that's what helps move us towards healthy grief. Rather than remaining a victim in our grief story, rather than trying to push away the grief and deny the grief, we instead accept that grief is necessary. So what does our culture suggest to us about our grief? Because that's kind of where we learn how to grieve, right? This is what I find the culture tells me. The culture says, oh, just deny death altogether. Um, in fact, because we do that, we hardly even use the word death or die when we're talking to somebody whose loved one has died. We'll say they've passed away or they're in a better place and or um, you're your, your loss, I'm so sorry for your loss. And we, we say every other word and trying to avoid the very word that I'm so sorry that your loved one died. So we live in a culture that denies. There we go. That was just a very brief clip from the beginning of this course. And um, as I said, Karen has six different segments on this that she goes over di different um, principles of grief. And Karen, on this course, just like you said about tonight's webinar, um, you're kind of talking about it from the perspective of a death, but those same principles of grief can be applied to any situation of loss. Absolutely, the principles are very applicable. Yeah. So if you are interested in this course or, um, for yourself because of a, a grief that you are, are dealing with um, or if you are interested in this course for a loved one or someone that you care about this would actually make a beautiful gift for someone who is is grieving um, to help them find hope and healing uh, we want to just let you know about the course and to make it available to you this evening the course um, the regular price for this course is just 89 dollars um, and um, like I said, this is the foundational principles of grief. So if you were to actually go see Karen for a coaching session, this is what she's going to start with, right, Karen? This is going to give you just the foundational um, principles that you can, that you would need to understand for healthy grief. So um, like I said, it's typically just $89 and that's for a lifetime access. But tonight we want to offer it to you. Um, for with the 20% discount and that discount, and I'm going to put it up here for you right now. If you were to go, um, you can click on this little black button and you would be able to get 20% off using the coupon code 20 November. Um, and this is, this code is going to be active through Thursday. So you have a little bit of time to think about it or think about who you know or love that could benefit from this. So, um, 20 November is the coupon code. You can click on that button and it'll take you to the order page, or you can also find it like, um, on the Beautiful Minds website. And I will put that in the chat box um, and it's beautifulmindswellness.org. And I think Karen um, also said that it is on her website as well. So um, we just wanted to let you know about that resource if you are interested in that um, for this holiday season. Yes, Michelle, I just do want to reiterate that the beautifulmindswellness.org is the website you want to go to. And I believe um, these courses, are they under the resource tab? They are under the, um, they would be under the resources tab. I think it's actually called services. And then you would select online courses. Right, and then they could actually hand type in um, 20 November, all caps, 
if they don't choose that link tonight. Um, would that be correct? Yes. Right. Absolutely. So we just want to leave you with um, the best of resources that you can take with you into this holiday um, time that is so un unpredictable. We won't know what it will be. Um, but you've all been here tonight and you've taken away some wonderful takeaways. And I'm so encouraged. Um, I'm looking and just really, really blessed by that. So I think that's it for tonight with me, Michelle. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you again, Karen, for being with us this evening. And I thank each of you for joining us this evening. I hope that the information that you learned is going to be helpful as you uh, move into this holiday season. I know that there's definitely some things that I learned about just preparing um, and acknowledging the grief that we've gone through and preparing, having a plan on how we are going to, um, how we're going to face that and how we're going to honor the person or the situation that we are grieving. So thank you again for coming. We just wish you a very blessed and happy Thanksgiving. And thank you for joining us this evening. Goodbye. Good night. Good night.